Why are Indians so much more likely to be promoted to the executive level of U.S. companies over other Asians, most namely Chinese? We've analyzed it. Here are some reasons. Yeah, I know this, this phenomenon. They're such good entrepreneurs. They're rising up the corporate ladder. But for Chinese, we got to go be entrepreneurs or we'll get left behind. Uh, we got to talk about it, Andrew, because there was this new study that came out from 2011 to 2023. Fortune 50 boards, which are the 50 biggest companies, right? There's Fortune 500, Fortune 100, Fortune 50. Got more diverse right so they did get more asians but of those asians almost all of them were indian mm, so we're going to talk about those reasons why obviously we compare indians and chinese quite often because those are two huge countries and with a lot of engineers and a lot of smart people lot, who come lot, to america a lot of nerds yes a lot of nerds between those countries but it seems that indians and namely indian men are being promoted to the executive level to the board of directors or the ceo level of american companies so much more than chinese but there may be reasons for that. So we got it. 10 reasons why Indians get promoted more than Chinese. Hit the like button, subscribe, turn on your notifications. Check out Small House House at smallhousehouse.com. And we made a video about this a year ago, but uh, there's been some new analysis with more granular data that has come out. So I think that that's what, uh, let's be honest though. The internet, Andrew, has about 100 posts wondering why there are so many Indian entrepreneurs rising up to the board of director or CEO level in American companies. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, for women, actually, interestingly enough, Andrew, 47% of the Asian women were Chinese women, though. Oh, so Chinese women and Indian men are being promoted at the highest rate. Why might that be? Um, number one, Andrew, this is the this is not actually supporting the Chinese side, but Indians support each other and uh, ch more than Chinese support other Chinese. Okay, so a lot of people use this as an example of this word homophily or things like that where it's basically Indians will support other Indians at the same time they don't have to only stick with themselves. So I think there's like this weird balance that I don't want to say weird actually it's a good balance that Indians are able to achieve where they support each other but they don't only hang out with themselves because if you only hang out with yourself, that's going to hurt your chances of being promoted at a non-Asian company. Right. So you're saying they almost have a mix and match. Right. Where they they are looking out for each other, but at the same time, they're willing to hang out with other people all the time. Like Indians often marry other Indians, but they often don't only spend time around other Indians outside of their family. Right. So. I think a lot of people have like an Indian friend in their friend group who only dates Indian girls, but is homies with everybody. Right. Um, moving on to number two, uh, Indians have a lot more exposure to WASP Anglo-Saxon culture due to the British Empire. China and Chinese culture are viewed as still very alien to the West. I mean, do you feel like this is generally true? Like, obviously, you know, India was colonized by the British and you could say that that was bad or good. But I guess one of the, I guess, beneficial byproducts is that a lot of Indians, especially in the, I would say, upper middle class Indians, they're more exposed and have been exposed to British culture for longer. And even some of them may have some British blood in them. Right. Well, I heard that in the upper classes in India, it's common to communicate with each other in English. Mm. Obviously, that's incredibly different in China. Pretty much uh, nobody speaks English to each other unless you're an international school kid. Yeah. And I think that Indians have done a great job of like, I don't know if they chose to do this, but to market their culture or to have their culture be appealing to a lot of Americans, whether it be, yeah. and on this on an anecdotal level, yoga, okay, yeah. curry and naan. These are like, I know that it, these are base less, level it, things. It's less inscrutable. I think yeah. a lot of like oriental or like Chinese culture is viewed as like inscrutable. You mean like cannot be understood? Yes, yes, yes. Cannot be under. I think people are like, believe that Indian things are exotic, but they can understand them. On a side note, I think that Indians have shown white people that their spirituality is like, like being spiritual. Like they're better than white people at being like spiritual. Yeah, well- I don't uh, know, I guess uh, that- Like uh, almost like outside of the Middle East, almost all the world's religions came from India. Right. Um, moving on, number four, uh, the cream of the crop comes to America due to the visa situation and just the ability to immigrate. Mm. So it does change things a lot. And you can see this reflected in our Nigerians. There's actually 230 million Nigerians around the world. The US gets most of, I don't know, you know, on a negative side, they call it brain drain, but you get all the elite ones coming to America. Like the highly educated ones, the ones who are are very focused on success and, and working yeah. hard. And a, a lot of elite Chinese or a lot of elite Asians 
or especially East Asians, they tend to stay in Asia. Yeah. Whether yeah. that's like Tokyo or Seoul or Shanghai or Beijing or Hong Kong or Shenzhen. Uh, I saw this really interesting comment that said that a lot of Asians, maybe particularly Chinese who are elite, there was a sense for a while that they wanted to go back to China and make China better versus some of the Indians when they left India, they would just leave India for America or the West like and not come back and try to build it up. I, I don't know how true that is, but it seems like there may be some truth to that. Uh, yeah, for sure. Obviously, you know, there, this is the biggest thing. Like, a lot of people don't understand immigration waves. Like, um, for example, Andrew, we know a lot of Hong Kong people that went to, like, Canada and Australia, but we don't know a lot of Hong Kong people that came to America. Mm, that's a good point. Good point. Point number four, the Indian CEOs are mostly immigrants and born in India. Immigrants tend to have a lot more hunger and motivation, whereas a lot of American-born Indians or just American born Asians are more comfortable being like middle to upper middle class and just having a well-rounded life. Yeah, listen, I think if you're the top of your class in India and you got the hunger and you make it to America, like what's this what's going to stop you, man? You're a hungry immigrant that's from a that's educated and you know how to speak English and yeah, and and also if you think about it, the pool of Indians that they're pulling from in India is so much greater. Because right. Otherwise, you're just trying to pick the top Indian American, which there's only a few million Indian Americans, right? Which is still quite a bit, but not compared to India, you have a huger pool. Right. And not only that, I think when you making it up in the American system, coming up in the American system, it's a good way to end up like in the middle or upper middle. But uh, there's this quote that says, no other nation in the world trains so many citizens in a gladiatorial manner such as India does. And this is a guy who used to be the executive director of Tata Sons, which is a gigantic company in India. From birth certificates to death certificates, from school admissions to getting jobs, from infrastructural inadequacies to sufficient capacities, he said basically everybody has to be a natural manager even just to make it out of india interesting yeah th all right that gladiatorial manner is a way to put it man i never even heard that word before yeah i mean <laughs> that's how the miami heat train their players you have to wear uh like cushioning pads because they want you to go so hard on each other in practice so the game seems so much easier um number five andrew this uh says dharmic teachings mean questioning everything and accepting nothing just because you are told. Yeah, so I guess I'm not an expert on this, so somebody can correct us, but a lot, quite a few people were mentioning Hindu Dharmic teachings where it was like, they're like behavioral teachings that I guess promote kind of asking questions and debating. So if you think about it, if India is a very highly religious place and a lot of people are Hindu, not everybody, but a lot of people are Hindu. And in Hinduism, they teach you to ask a lot of questions and debate well. Right then, and just learning is so much deeply ingrained in their religion, then I guess I could see that benefiting them in this case. Like, right. for example, even Buddhism is from India or, you know, Buddhism and, and the other religions. Is it a, is a Dharmic religion? Yeah, yeah, a lot of it's about, like, sitting there and learning about yourself and, like, you know, Buddha, like, stared at a rock and saw through it after a long time. Like, that's how serious they are about, like, learning about thyself right. and meditating. Actually, I looked into it almost all the Indians that are in the board of directors or C-suite level in America actually are Hindus. And actually the vast majority of them come from South India, mm. which is, uh, I, I, it's known South to be- South Indians which, killing yeah, it. Which is more known to be a very technical place. A lot of software, a lot of IT, you know, uh, Chinese more known for hardware. South side. Microchips and things like that. Uh, number six, it all goes down, comes down to their ability to be assertive. So mm. basically a lot of people were just saying that when you rank- a lot of people with uh, different personality metrics, Indians or South Asians in general, but specifically Indians, they rank much, much higher on the assertive metric than East Asians. Yeah, a or, lot of people- Southeast Asians too. Uh, and a lot of people pointed out it's partially due to the fact that India is such a multi-ethnic and multi-religious place. And that, so it's kind of, it is kind of crazy or it's kind of hard to organize. So to get out of the noise and to be heard, you have to be extra assertive. So due to the- maybe chaoticness of certain aspects right. of their country, I guess, that you have to be more assertive and direct to even make it through. I'll tell you this. This is an anecdote, guys. Uh, 
I remember being in Kuala Lumpur and they have a very big Indian population there. And I remember I had never been to like seven different restaurants right next to each other that were blasting their own gigantic speaker of music that was all different music. It was like hearing seven gigantic speakers playing different songs at the same time. And that was in the India town. Yes, in, that, was, that in, was in Little India in Kuala Lumpur. And, and I just remember being like, yo, this is crazy. Yeah. I've never seen anything like this before. Um, they also rank higher in extroversion, persuasion, self-promotion, and much lower on uh, demure or docile metrics. Yeah, on a side note, anecdotally, I just always feel like Indians are not afraid to get involved in things like to kind of join clubs or like mix with people and not being afraid. And maybe it's not like fear of getting hurt or anything but they just maybe like they have a certain confidence that they're like oh yeah i'm gonna check out this club or i'm gonna check out this kind of fellowship or i'm gonna check out like this training course yeah. or i'm just gonna i'm just gonna network with these people i'm not afraid right like an network. indian will come up to you and be like hey guys what are you talking about can i get it in the conversation yeah, I, I have had Where? random conversations on the street with random indian guys for sure and they just spark sparking a conversation i'll say a chinese person is almost like the last guy that's gonna do that yeah chinese it's people almost, it's almost like the inverse of that that is, that's kind of true. Uh, point number seven. It's simple. China is considered a geopolitical rival to the U.S. and it challenges their world dominance. India is not necessarily a military ally of the U.S., but they are used in a sense to contain China. This is, yeah. by, by the way, not my words. This is just me pulling a bunch of stuff from the oh, internet. Oh, I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, I don't, like, India and America have a positive relationship. I think that's safe to say. They partner on a lot of things. Um and so it's definitely not a rival or an enemy, but obviously if you're from China, it's messed up. Like if you're immigrating from China or you're coming from schooling from China, you have to now be worried whether your college may have engaged or is partially sponsored by the Chinese military, which and then if the U.S. government wanted to look into that, could stop you from pursuing your major in America. Like, so there's all these geopolitical things outside of your control, if you're Chinese, that could stop you and make you feel less trusted here. And, and that's unfortunate, but that is the situation right now. Right, right. Um, obviously, yeah, to be fair, a lot of the quote unquote, and or at least what they call Chinese female CEOs, they're actually from Taiwan. They're not necessarily like mainland CEOs. Ah, Lisa Su, sense. AMD, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, the Taiwanese. Ooh. Well, with the Taiwanese, if you guys know... Uh, or Chinese ethnic people from Taiwan, they have a completely different geopolitical relationship with the West or the Anglo sphere uh, uh, than uh, mainland China does. I may sum it up too simply, David, but like uh, Taiwanese would be considered like the Hindu Brahmins. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, no, I mean, I would say that maybe like mainland Chinese would almost be considered maybe uh, maybe more Muslim daisies or something like that, like right, a little right. bit outside. It. Um, point number eight, 30% of the world's software engineers let alone computer scientists are from India. And now a lot of backend work or bookkeeping stuff or whatever, like certain levels, tiers of programming are being outsourced back to India. So why wouldn't you get an Indian CEO that can communicate with all the, uh, you know what I mean? Like all the portions of the company that are located in India as well as America. No, that makes sense. And I don't know, maybe there's like some other factor with like, if all like the tech support people or the people working in India know that there's an Indian CEO of this U.S. company, then they're like, I don't know, maybe they're more inspired. I get, I, that's an possible. interesting theory. It's an interesting theory. I mean, I'll say this, you know, like it makes sense if you look at STEM companies or tech companies like software companies, CEOs, they have to be a proportion of how many STEM or tech graduates that country produces right 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 right. right. if you cross-reference it with that it makes a lot more sense than looking at obviously indian americans less than one percent of the u.s and they make up like let's say 15 percent of tech ceos that's a 15x but if you cross-reference it with on a global workplace scale with the graduates it almost just seems like it just lines up um number nine with all the reasons listed above Indians are typically thought of to make better managers, and that is the primary role of the CEO because they have to manage not only that, and they have to manage the board of the directors, which represent the stakeholders, but also all the internal team that is supposed to execute on the demands of the stakeholders. Right, so I think this point is trying to say, and I saw this uh, in multiple comments where it was like, Listen, being hired hired as CEO is very different than starting your own company, but being hired as CEO means you have to work with the board of directors, 
right? So you're managing a bunch of stuff. You're not necessarily determining exactly where the company goes, but you have to manage a bunch of people and due to all the reasons that we've listed above. And, and know, oftentimes people with competing agendas. Yeah, like exactly. the board and wants to push up the stock price. So think the about workers it. want better compensation. If you got to deal with the board of directors and all these different aspects of your company, maybe that's like in India where they got to deal with all these different ethnic groups and ethno-religious groups. You know what I mean? Like it is yeah. diverse out there and, and, and you're just like used to managing chaos. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, look at that quote from the guy from Tata basically saying like a glad, you know, it's like a gladiator coming up. All right, David, now we've come to this one reason that I saw that was interesting. I'm not saying it's a big factor, but it stood out to me. Somebody had mentioned that it might help be helpful that Indian men don't have to deal with being unmarried too long because if they're a successful, educated Indian man, they will find a wife or have an arranged marriage. Or some sort of like in-between version right, that right. is very common nowadays on matchmakers. They will get married one way or another, meaning that they have some type of built-in family and social structure, which allows them to work better and work more focused. And versus, also people in the board of directors may relate to you more if you have a family because they probably have families. Exactly. And, well, and stable corporate people have families. And the people were comparing this to possibly the situation with Chinese men, which Chinese men, obviously a lot of them still get married too, but it's not as like set up for them to they, get married. They, sometimes they got to fight for it. Yeah. And it's like, if you got to fight for marriage and fight for a family and then also fight for your company, maybe that's a lot of uh, willpower. But anyways, it's just that I'm not saying that's a huge factor, but I thought that was an interesting comment. Right, right, right. By the way, guys, these are all supplementary reasons to our original video. We'll just pop it up right here. I'll say this, man. I just think there's a lot of reasons for a lot of things. Anytime you see something get overrepresented like 10x, 15x, 20x relative to the what the stats should be, doesn't there have to be reasons? I mean, did you know that 90% of Fortune 100 CEOs are still white? Mm. But it just means that the ones that aren't white are usually Indian. Right, right, right. I mean, for me, I think, uh, and for anybody watching, it's like, I, th I think the major factors are the assertiveness culture and the English fluency. And as a third factor, I do think it's China is considered a, a, a hostile rival to America. That's a big political factor that has held back chinese born people from gaining certain clearances and security and stuff like that in multiple companies it happens right. and it's been even happening for a couple decades now so it's not a new issue but it is a real issue so i think those are to me the top three factors it's like indians they're more better at being assertive asking questions speaking english and the fact that they come from like a neutral or positive country to the u.s by the way chinese I guys if you are watching this and you're like oh dang it seems like there's a lot of factors against this i'm like no, I just think that at the end of the day, for whatever reason, whether it's the assertiveness or English fluency, Indians are seen as more... Well, they're part of the anglo -sphere. Yeah, yeah. They're seen they're as... They're literally not alien to it. Yeah, they're, they're seen as more Western people. I'm not saying they are all Western over there, but they are seen as more Westernized people. So I guess the only thing really Asian guys can do is just... Or Chinese guys, for example, is just, I guess, appear to be more Western, right? Is that the best but, you can do? But even then they may feel like they're capped out in terms of how high they can rise as an entrepreneur within a corporate structure. However, you could also go work at a bunch of Asian companies or right. Asian owned companies right, too, right, which right. is your uh, sort of your lateral move. Right. Anyway, guys, let us know what you think it is in the comments section below. I always say this, listen, there's a reason why the Denver Nuggets are the best team in the NBA, and there's a reason why the Detroit Pistons are the absolute worst team in the NBA, and they could even run some of the same sets, but it doesn't matter because they don't have the same players, and they don't have the same coaching staff, and they just don't have the same desires and capacities, you know? Like, there's explanations for everything. Those are some of the explanations why most of the execs are white, but the ones that aren't ex white in the Western world are mostly Indian. Let us know what you think of the, uh, it in the comments section below. Um, I'm sure there's going to be some really interesting comments. And until next time, we're the Hot Pot Boys. We out. Peace. Peace.